Good evening. Uh, thank you so much again for taking time out of your schedules to be with us for another history lecture series. Uh, these things are great, as you know. Uh, uh, we have a passion for them. We think we uh, are one of the few colleges around, institutions around that have such a program, and we do so well with attendance and so forth. I know we might be a little light tonight. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, we'll get back to those in good shape. I need to let you know that uh, we are planning that we're going to have our 50th history lecture series next month. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty, that, yeah, that's and and all, uh, all the glory goes to uh, uh, Dr. Manning, Curtis Manning, for all he's done to start this thing, to Ron Chapman for all the presentations he's made for us, and to Nick Sly for taking this thing over last year and doing a wonderful job. So we appreciate all that they've done for us, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So next, next month is our 50th, and barring anything unforeseen with somebody coming in, hopefully, and starting to fix us back up, we're going to be here. The, uh, the lecture will be on March the 10th now. March the 3rd is the first Monday. We're going, to send some, we're going to send you out one, maybe even two correspondences on that. So March the 10th, if you can remember that. If you come on the 3rd, what we'll do is maybe set up in the back and have some wine and cheese and sandwiches and we'll let you all talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to do that on, on March 10th. If, if it works out, and, and again, we're, we're, it's in the planning stage, so bear with us. It's in the planning stage. If it works out, we'll try to cover those 50 uh, uh, lectures that we've had. That's going to be difficult, but I think uh, these guys can do it. They're, they're really good. Uh, between Dr. Manning, uh, Mr. Chapman, and Mr. Sly, they'll put something together great. And, and again, uh, we'll depend on maybe some of our people from uh, Chalmette who do a good job for us. We'll always take these things. They may have a couple of ideas to help us out with, with putting it on. So, so Barry and Jack, uh, we're giving you fair warning that you may be a little part of this planning process. Uh, so bear with that. Listen, we're going to send you some correspondence. And, and remember that this is all for, for, for the community and for you, and, and we're very proud to put it on. Tonight, we're going to talk about Stonewall Jackson. Not Andrew Jackson. Stonewall Jackson. It's a different Jackson, and I'm going to leave that up to our great uh, historian and presenter, uh, Mr. Ron Chapman. Ron, come on up. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. Technology, I had one switch. Uh, when we talk about Stonewall Jackson, first we talk about just briefly about the Civil War in general, and that the strategy of the North was basically to take Richmond and unify the country. The strategy of the South was to protect Richmond, to extend the war out as long as they possibly could, with the hopes that England and France might be drawn into it. As a result, what happened on the battlefield was critical. And this gentleman we're about to talk about, Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson, was a very critical player in the overall plan of the Confederacy in keeping the war going. His loss was a tremendous loss to the Confederacy. As uh, Lee said at the time, General, you've lost your, right arm, your left arm, I've lost my right. That was the effect of it. This lecture will talk about his life, his early campaigns, but mostly it's going to focus on his death. because. If you read history books, they reference the fact that he went out far in advance of his troops on a reconnaissance mission, somewhat uh, boldly, and was coming back when he was shot, and then he would later linger and then die of pneumonia. Recent research is indicating that that might not be exactly the sequence of events as to what happened. So we'll be focusing on just exactly how he died at the latter part of this lecture. First of all, he was born uh, January 21st, 1824, in uh, Clarksville, Virginia. He was seven years old when his mother passed away. His father had died before then. So as a result, he was an orphan. So he went to live with his maternal uncle in Jackson's Mill. In 1842, at the age of 18, he entered West Point. He didn't have a formal education. His problem was being a farm boy. You know, his, his aunt and uncle tried to teach him as much reading and writing as they possibly could. But he was, uh, I guess you'd say, a developmental student by the time he got to uh, West Point. 
Nevertheless, he graduated 17th out of 59 in his class, and his classmates would say had he been given another year, he probably would have graduated first. He was a very brilliant man and a very hard worker. He entered the Mexican War soon after graduation, as did most of the, uh, the generals of the Civil War, and that's what's interesting. The Mexican War is a rehearsal for the American Civil War. Uh, Grant meets Lee in the Mexican War, Jackson meets Lee in the Mexican War, and what happens is all these men are fighting together in the Mexican War, and then soon thereafter, when America divides, they have to choose which side they're going to go with. That's why these men knew one another on a personal level, and also understood one another's strategies in combat. In 1851, after the Mexican War, he goes to VMI, Virginia Military Institute, and becomes a teacher. Uh, there's some talk about him having a bit of a personality problem in that he was painfully, painfully shy. So the idea of speaking to a group and engaging in conversation wasn't part of his way of dealing with things. He would sit down and memorize the lecture, walk in, say it, and then walk out. Needless to say, the students didn't appreciate that. If they asked a question, he'd get all flustered and upset. So they actually had a movement to have him removed from the college simply because he just lacked the ability to communicate and work well. What he taught them, though, is cardinal rules of military, which to this day is still taught at VMI as well as West Point. Discipline, mobility, assessing the enemy's strength and intentions while attempting to conceal your own. In fact, in the 1960s, a submarine was named after him, and it was mobility and strength was written across the top of the conning towel. Okay? He was deeply religious throughout his life. I mean, he read his Bible religiously, he prayed continuously before every battle he would pray, his men would see his lips moving as he would mumble to himself his prayers before he went in. He was a southern man, but he neither apologized for nor no spoke in favor of the practice of slavery. He was somewhat ambivalent. You have to remember that he's a man of his times, as was Lincoln. Okay? He had slaves, but it's a curious thing if you read into it, we can't get into that now, but some of them actually requested to be purchased by him, and one of them was a little girl that was basically given to him to become an assistant to his wife, because she was a, a retarded child, and they wanted her to be taken care of. At that time, especially after Nat Turner's rebellion, there was a very strong movement against educating slaves in any way. Nevertheless, Jackson, who was revered by many African Americans in the town of Lexington, he is instrumental in organizing 1855 Sunday school classes in the Presbyterian Church for the African American community that was there. He felt there was a need, his belief in God was so strong that they should know to be closer to God, which also likely, but you don't really get into the particulars, would have included reading, which is something that was anathema to teaching slaves how to read. As one quote put it at the time, in their religious instruction, he succeeded wonderfully. His discipline was systematic and firm, but very kind. His servants reverenced and loved him as they would have a brother or father. He was emphatically the black man's friend. That might be a bit of an overstatement to say that about any slave owner, so to speak. But nevertheless, you know, it does give a temper of what people, some of the people at the time felt about him. On November 1859, VMI, he led the candidates, 21 students with artillery, to Harper's Ferry. I don't know if you know what happened there, but there was a man by the name of John Brown who was a very rabid abolitionist in Kansas. The pro-slavery elements in Kansas called Bloody Kansas attacked Lawrence, Kansas, and in doing so, he retaliated by going into southern Kansas, grabbing pro-slavery men, five of them actually at random from their farmhouses, bringing them out to Pottawatomie Creek and executing them. Okay? Later, he hatched this idea that he wanted to form a format of slave rebellion in the South, and the way to do that was to get arms. So him and his sons and several adherents attacked Harper's Ferry, which was a major arsenal. The man who came, the Union, it wasn't Union, actually the American general who was sent to confront him and take back the arsenal was a man by the name of Robert E. Lee. Jackson took students from VMI with their artillery to assist Lee. So here you have the cooperation of these two men even before the Civil War begins. However, soon thereafter, in 1861, he would join the Confederate Army. The issue of Harper's Ferry is important in a way because John Brown was revered in the North, especially by poets like Emerson. Remember, John Brown's body lies molding in the grave. You know, they said looked up to him as this great hero for abolitionism, whereas in the South, he was more considered like a bin Laden type character, a terrorist who was out to destroy everything they believed in by whatever means possible. The differences on their attitudes towards uh, Harper's Ferry kind of signified the differences in the divisions within the North and the South at that time. 
Other nicknames that Jackson had were Old Jack, Old Blue Light, and Tom Fool. I have a feeling that was probably something his students said about him that uh, he wasn't too privy to. This is the family estate, his uncle's estate at, uh, at uh, uh, Mills Farm. Stonewall Jackson's a hero. He early established his ability to lead. He played a critical role in many Civil War engagements. He also became one of the most celebrated soldiers in the Confederacy. As I said at the time, Jackson has been described as the Army's hammer, Longstreet its anvil. And that was the advantage that Lee had by having these two men, Longstreet on one side and Jackson on the other, who had two totally different ways of looking at things and conducting themselves. But it was like hand and glove when they worked in cooperation. Jackson's forces played a critical role in the Battle of Antietam, one of the bloodiest battles in American history. We'll talk about that. He also was involved in the Battle of Fredericksburg, which was a decisive uh, Confederate victory, another attempt by the Union to take Richmond. The Battle of Chancellorsville was perhaps one of his greatest victories. It showed his prowess and his ability to move and to size up a situation. And that was in May 2nd. But at the peak of his power, he would be cut down by friendly fire. This is a picture of Jackson, probably in his military uniform early, probably as a cadet, I would imagine, at West Point. Here you can see he looks a little bit more disheveled. The uniform's not quite so crisp. Interesting, if you see his arms tucked into his coat, he always did that because he suffered from the belief that his left arm was longer than his right, and he was embarrassed by that. So any chance he'd get, he'd stick it in his pocket or stick it in his coat or something like that. This just goes to show how personal he was. And this here is a picture taken. Actually, this is likely one of the last photographs taken, you know, urged by his wife several weeks before his death. I think these uh, pictures here indicate that uh, this be, uh, age is cruel. <laughs> so, as we all know, or if we don't, we soon will. This is a, a painting done of Jackson. And the thing that's interesting is you want to look at the uniform. Jackson was not a man. A lot of the Southern generals went out of their way to dress themselves up rather flamboyantly to show their style. Jackson did not. Jackson would very often be mistaken for an enlisted man, except for the epaulets, you know, and his, and his collar emblems. He'd wear a regular cavalry cap, more like anyone else, okay? This is a poster which is probably more accurate of the way Jackson would actually look. So he could be easily, and when you think about it, it's almost brilliant because from an, an, an opponent's position, you really wouldn't know who was in charge because he wouldn't be dressed as if he was in command. Nevertheless, he was, and at the time of his wounding, People that his own men didn't realize who had been hit simply because he wasn't dressed as a general. Some would finally find out and word would filter through the lines to their horror. Okay? This is likely, this or the other one, we're not really sure, was the last photograph taken because after this great victory at Fredericksburg, his wife brought to him their newborn daughter and Laura, Julia Laura is actually her name, and uh, they spent some time together and then he went off to fight at Chancellorsville and then she went back home to Lexington. Oops, went to too far there. You need a little help here, Nick. There you go. This is Jackson and Sorrel. Yeah, a lot of times you see pictures of Andrew Jackson, and uh, he's on this beautiful steed. Like Lee kept his thoroughbred. He had a horse. <laughs> he was like a quarter horse. And when he'd pull up next to the other guy, sometimes they were towering up above him. But Sorrel was this famous animal. They went through all the battles together, all the charges together, and it was the horse that he was shot off of when the deadly day arrives. So now we get into the Civil War. This picture is a painting that was done that's probably more accurate. Here he is telling his wife goodbye in the snows of uh, North Carolina as he heads off. But you can see he's almost indistinguishable from the rest of his men. That's the way he liked it. The first conflict in the Civil War is the Battle of Bull Run, July, Sunday, July 21st, 1861. What happens is the Union troops are amassed and they're convinced, everybody's convinced, that this is going to be over with after one or two short battles and it'll be done within about a month. Nobody expects it to go on for four long years. Certainly, no one expects 460,000 men to die in that period of time. More men died in the Civil War than in all the other wars of the United States combined. At the Battle of Antietam, more men died than at D-Day. Okay? So this just goes to show you the violence. At this time, they didn't know that. Union troops invaded the South, and when they came in their trail, congressmen came, spectators came in buggies with picnic baskets. It was going to be a great big party. The Union troops lined up and they charged into the southern territory, the object being to take out Richmond, let's just end this thing with one quick stab. So at 9.30, 13,000 Union troops crossed Bull Run Creek into Confederate territory. 
They immediately scored several very quick victories and were driving the Confederates away and back. At that point then, General Thomas, Jonathan Jackson, and his troops were looked up and they had a ground in Henry Horse Hill where they were taking a tremendous attack, but because of his discipline, he insisted that his men hold their line. They held their line and they refused to give. At that point, General B cried out to his men, look, there's Jackson with his Virginians standing like a stone wall. That's where he gets the name. He didn't appreciate the name. He never called himself Stonewall Jackson. He called his men the Stonewall Brigade. But everybody else referred to him as Stonewall Jackson. The Union troops were stopped. They retreated. He organized an assault against them, and they literally retreated through the streets of Washington. Pandemonium broke out, and for a moment they thought that the Confederacy was going to take Washington, D.C., rather than the Union take in Richmond. From that day on, he was known as Stonewall Jackson. Following that, Lee decided to send him into the Shenandoah Valley because he knew there was a lot of support there. So he begins his valley campaign. June 1862 completed one of the most impressive months in all military history. He was assigned to General Fremont. He attacked Robert Shanks' army at the Battle of McDowell, then turned and attacked Nathaniel Banks' army outside of Richmond. Nathaniel Banks would later become the general in charge of the Louisiana detachment here after uh, Spoon's butler was removed, or the Beast Butler, depending on what nickname you want to throw on him. On May 23rd, he again defeated Banks' men at Front Royal, Virginia. On May 25th, he defeated Banks again at the Battle of Winchester. Lincoln was so upset about what he was doing that he ordered more men sent up against him, whom he again defeated at the Battle of Cross Keys. He was running between the Shenandoah Valley and Richmond, back and forth at a tremendous pace. Jackson held 60,000 Federals at bay, fought four major battles, and not counting all the many skirmishes that took place during that time, taking over enemy supplies. This is from the diary of Laura Lee, who lived in Winchester. Thanks be to the Lord, we are free. The trauma of civilians on both sides of the conflict was great as their home and properties were taken. I don't know if you all have seen the story Cold Mountain, the film. I think it really lets you see what the civilians went through. I mean, they, their men were gone. They had to work to fields themselves. When Confederates came in, they took things. When Union troops came in, they took things. They had Jayhawkers that came in and raped and pillaged as they went. It was a four years of absolute chaos. And so to have the Union troops out and the Confederates in, she thought was a good thing. Jackson's Winchester victory was celebrated throughout the Confederacy, primarily because these people were free from Union forces, but more important because defeat after defeat had been inflicted on the Confederates around Richmond. This gave them something to cheer about, and that's one of the advantages of Jackson. When things were at their lowest, Jackson was able to pull off something to kind of build up their morale to give them some reason to hope that victory might be at hand. If you can imagine this, he traveled 646 miles in 48 days, and uh, he won five major battles. He had 17,000 men against 60,000. You know, from that point on, he gave the term foot cavalry to his men because people were convinced they were all on horseback because how could they move so quickly from point A to point B? One of the things was he used a railroad tunnel that nobody really knew about through the Shenandoah Valley and the mountains there, and that's how he was able to shift his forces back and forth so rapidly. But nevertheless, you know, he, his men followed him anywhere he went. However, he did have some problems. The Battle of Mechanicsville, it was a major battle that Lee had organized in the Seven Days Campaign. Jackson did not arrive in time. Nobody knows what held him in abeyance. But as a result, an attempt to overthrow Porter's army was stalled, and the Confederates took a pretty heavy licking on the part of the retreating Union forces. Had Jackson been there as he was supposed to have been there, they might have been able to defeat Porter's army. Then he also had his men rest in the site of the battle. At the Battle of Gaines Creek, Again, Lee had hit the Union forces soon after that. Again, he failed to arrive in time. And in fact, people were somewhat concerned because he seemed confused and disoriented about what was going on. And this was a man who was incredibly decisive. So with these two defeats, all of a sudden people were wondering, you know, what is this thing with Stonewall? You know, has he lost it? And I guess we've all seen that and experienced that in our lives. However, there's a period of redemption after that. The second bull run. It's the second time now that the Union forces amass this tremendous army crossing Manassas or Bull Run to enter into the Confederate Virginia and take Richmond. Jackson maneuvered around General Pope's army and struck at the supply depot, not only getting the supplies for himself, but depriving it of the Union of their own supply trains. As a result, it broke the back of the invasion. Okay? 
So the combined Confederate operation in Generals Lee's Jackson and Longstreet forced the Federals again to retreat, but most is because of this tremendous operation by Jackson. It's in this operation, the second Bull Run, that Clara Barton arrives in, in August 31st to tend to Union soldiers, which is the beginning of the Red Cross. I just thought I'd throw that in as a sidelight because she felt like she had to do something, she wanted to do something, so she asked if she could help, she got permission, and she came in and she was nursing the soldiers, you know, and, and the horrible wounds that they'd experienced. Because the only thing you could do for a person that was shot back then was on the limb was to amputate. You know, because usually when you were shot, the bullet was lead, it was dirty, the uniforms, these men hardly had chances to bathe, so parts of the uniforms would be sunk into the wound, so the, and the, the bones would be shattered, the blood vessels would be broken, and the chance for saving the limb were limited, the chance for infection, the gangrene were great, so the best thing to do is just cut the flesh around, saw off the bone, cauterize it, and then go to the next one. You have these images of piles of arms and legs behind the hospitals. That's the way it was. Next great victory was Antietam. It's at this attempt where Lee decides to bring the war home to the Union by going into Pennsylvania. Funny things happen in wars a lot of times. I've always said the little things make big things happen. I know a reference in the Battle of New Orleans, but for a piece of wood. Had they taken a piece of wood and thrown it in the Mississippi and found out there was a current there, Packingham might have done something different. What happens at Antietam is Lee's laid out all of his orders, distributes it to his generals. One of his generals takes the orders, wraps it around some cigars and ties it loses the cigars at his campsite. They move on. Unexpectedly, Union troops come up to the same campsite. A private looks down, sees these cigars on a piece of paper, picks it up, opens it up, and has Lee's entire battle plan. McClellan now knows what Lee's going to do. And that's what forestalls the Battle of Antietam for being a Confederate victory. It ends up basically being a draw. Nevertheless, as you can see here, the two armies met in the deadliest single day of battle, 12,469 Union and 17,240 Confederate casualties. 29,000 men down in one day. Not all dead, but down. And most of them will die over time simply because of infections and the lack of anything. You have you know, nothing to prevent infections, nothing to knock you out. You're lucky if you get a shot of booze before you go in to surgery. Okay. Jackson's men would bear the brunt of the initial attacks on the northern end of the battlefield, and at the end of the day, he successfully prevented a Union victory, which allowed it to be a draw. So the Confederacy would have to withdraw back in towards Richmond, but at least they weren't defeated. Lincoln will be furious with McClellan because McClellan doesn't follow up and crush the Confederate army. At that point, he fires McClellan and turns to General Hooker to be in command of the troops from that point on. The next battle is Fredericksburg. Finally, Hooker decides to go after the Confederates, and at Fredericksburg, Jackson's second corps tell off a tremendous Union assault against the right flank of the Confederate line. It's at this point that his daughter, Julia Laura, is born. After this battle, his wife comes to him with his daughter, and that's when she has that picture taken of him, because she wants a picture taken of him, not realizing that would be the last picture ever taken. And she says that it's really not a good one, because photography back then wasn't quick. It was rather slow. He was in a breezeway of a room, and he had kind of a frown on his face, because the wind was blowing in the dust of his face as they were trying to snap this shot with one of those old tintographs. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, there's a lot of fanciful type pictures that are done you know, romanticized. This is one of those romanticized victory pictures. This is uh, Antietam at this point here. This is the Battle of Antietam, and you can see Jackson up this way here. You can see Hill and McClellan's troops coming up against him. This is the area he holds and allows the Confederates, when the draw comes place, to take a retreat across the Potomac River back into Virginia. It's called Antietam in the south and Sharpsburg in the north. This is the battle that will be his greatest battle and will also bring about his death. Chancellorsville, Jackson's last battle. It's Friday, May, 3rd, May 1st, 1863. Union General Hooker is contacted by President Lincoln. They sit down, he says, we're gonna take Richmond this time. At this point, he's got 70,000 troops that he marches across the Rappahannock River into what's called the Wilderness Area north of Richmond. The idea is to strike at Richmond finally and break the back of the Confederacy, okay? Lee finds out about what's going on, is, amazed, is aware of the moves, but he only has 47,000 men to confront him. So this is a very precarious situation he finds himself in. Hooker then gets to Chancellorsville and establishes a defensive position. If there's ever one problem that Lincoln's got is finding Union generals who will fight hard. A lot of them were hesitant. 
That's why when word came to him about Grant's victories in the West, he was enthused about Grant until somebody told him, well, you know, he drinks. At which point Lincoln said, well, find out what it is and give a bow to every one of my generals. And that's how Lincoln and Grant got together, because Grant was a fighter. The rest of these men were somewhat hesitant, much the same with Hooker. Okay? Jackson, what happens is, and I'll show you this in a thing, Lee's caught in a situation where he's caught on two sides by overwhelming odds. And what he does is the unconscionable for a general. He splits his troops, puts a holding line in one direction, and moves most of his men against Hooker. It's at this point where his son Fitzhugh Lee and Jackson go up on a hilltop and look down and see Hooker's main army off in the distance with some woods all around them, and they've bivouacked. At this point, Fitzhugh looks at it and turns to Jackson and says, what do you think? And he sees his lips mumbling. And he's curious about what it is, and he's realizing he's praying. And then he takes a little sorrow, he turns around, and he heads off riding down the road. Fitzhugh then turns back, you know, heads to his dad to tell him, well, I've acquainted him with the situation is. Jackson will lead his men quietly through the woods. I'll show you how he does it. And he strikes at 6 p.m. May 2nd. So it's a night attack, basically. It's at dusk, which is something you don't do. The Union soldiers at this time have bivouacked. Their guns are laid aside. They got fires going, they're cooking dinner, they're scrubbing their feet, they got their boots off, they're relaxed because they're in a far off position where they perceive themselves to be. What happens is amazing. The Union troops are down there, as I said, they're eating their dinner, they're relaxing, and all of a sudden they hear some noises in the woods and they see a bunch of rabbits come running out the woods. And that kind of startles them. Then they start seeing deer and all these animals come running out the woods. And it's like, what is going on here? So they're somewhat shocked as they see this apparition before them. And soon thereafter, they hear these bloody rebel yells, and it suddenly dawns on them that it's a surprise attack by Stonewall Jackson coming through the woods behind them. Pandemonium breaks out in the Union lines at this point. Okay? As a consequence, Hooker then is forced to retreat, another Union retreat, on May 4th. At the time, though, Hooker had no idea of the major loss that had taken place on the Confederate side. This is, uh, again, these one of those romantic meetings of uh, Lee and Jackson sitting down talking. You can see the thoroughbred and the little horse there. This is a really romanticized picture, probably Courier and I, because here you have a major battle raging, and here you have Jackson falling off of his horse, surrounded by his men. It did not happen that way. This is a photograph of the Rappahannock River at Chancellorsville. You can see the destruction. The trees are all broken, kind of like Katrina. You think about it. This is a gully here, one of the lines where I see all the Confederate dead laying in his defensive positions. This is, I don't know if uh, Matthew Brady took this shot or not, but it likely could have been since he was the one who documented most of the Civil War. This is what happened. In essence, you can see here that the Union have completely surrounded Lee. Lee has put a defensive position here and brought some of his soldiers here. It's at this hillock over here where Lee acquaints Jackson with the, with the situation with Howard's men over here. So what he does is he comes all the way down through Brock Road, passes Plank Road, goes to the turnpike by the Wilderness Tavern. This is all woods. This is called the Wilderness. And charges through the Wilderness and hits Howard's army at this point and creates total pandemonium in the army. Okay? While this is taking place, it's now nighttime. It's 9 o'clock at night. The skirmishing is still taking place. Cannon fire is still going on. There's a lot of confusion. Anybody familiar with black powder knows there's a lot of smoke in the air. Nobody really knows where anybody is. You don't have radio communications as they are. And Jackson's doing what he can to move his men forward to take full advantage of the retreating federal troops. This is about where the incident happens. So what exactly happened? This is a picture of the old Plank Road. What happened? Captain Eagleton Wilborn rode with Jackson at the time of the shooting. He wrote a letter to Faulkner in May, same May, 1863. It was 9 p.m. Jackson rode forward with the staff to assess the situation. Wilbur returned from delivering an order further up. There were, you, there were Confederate troops further forward. He wasn't totally in advance of his men. Wilbur came back. He says, well done. This is the few, last few words he really hears from Jackson at that point. General James Lane's brigade extended across Plank Road. If you saw that picture before, Plank Road came up and the Confederate troops crossed it on both sides. Therein lie the problem. When firing commenced, all of our horses had been frightened and started off, some moving towards the enemy lines. What happens, 
Jackson is going up with his men. He's encouraging the Confederates to move forward, but he's got a stationary position behind him, defensive line across Plank Road. In the confusion, he is coming back towards the lines. His own men hear him coming and open fire on Stonewall Jackson, and basically his entire executive staff is there coming in. At the first fire, some of the horses were shot from under their riders and several persons were killed or wounded. Mr. Conley from our signal corps fell at Jackson's feet, dead, okay? General Jackson's horse, Saul, then dashes off in the opposite direction of the fire. Some of the horses went towards the Union lines, others of the horses crossed Plank Road and went to the other side. That was to the left of the first firing. They did this to escape the fire. I was at General Jay's, that's how he references him, left side and kept there. When we got in about 15 to 20 paces to the left of the road, we came in a few yards of the troops of the same brigade on the left road, and then they started firing on them. At which point, one of the commanders ran forward, told him, stop your firing, stop your firing, you're shooting at your own men. The commander of the Confederates didn't believe it and ordered another volley in there. It took a while for them to sort out that they were shooting at their own guys, okay? It was by this last fire, the General Jackson was struck in three places, least in the left arm, halfway between the elbow and the shoulder, the left wrist, and the palm of his right hand. Okay? Controversy. Most historians contend, and if you read a lot of survey texts and things like this, that he advanced far in advance of his lines and was returning when shot. This is a rather reckless activity to do, especially at night in Calvary through the woods. Jackson had a little more sense than that. Wilborn's account indicates that Jackson was in advance of the main body, but was pushing Confederate forces forward when he came under attack from his own men. Further reinforcing that is General Jubal Early. He writes in 1878, accounts show how very erroneous are the generally received accounts, and it now appears that instead of riding to the front to reconnoiter the enemy, then imprudently galloping back towards his own lines, General Jackson was slowly riding to the front while making every effort to hurry forward the troops when he was fired upon by a portion of his own men on the right galloped into the woods on the left to escape the fire when he was fired upon by another body of troops on the north side of the road. So that think firmly establishes the fact that this is just an incredible, it wasn't recklessness on his part, it was friendly fire. And how many men have we lost even in Iraq and everywhere else to friendly fire? This here is Dr. Hunter Holmes McGuire. He's the surgeon who will take care of him. What we know about Jackson's wounds come from this man's diaries as much as we know. And there's a problem there and we'll get into it in a second. Okay. He was born in 1835, died in 1900. He was 27 years old at the time he's taken care of Jackson at Chancellorsville. However, he was a very important surgeon. He was the leader of Jackson's uh, medical corps. On top of that, he was a professor and full doctor at the age of 22. Of course, medical schools then aren't like they are now, with endless training. So uh, he was elected president of the American Medical Association in his later life. The reason I'm focusing on him is because his, what he talks about with Jackson, I think, is important. And you can see this is not just a bone man. You know, they want to call him a bone crusher. This is a legitimate doctor who knows what he's doing. I had the noblest heritage to sort of hand down to my children is the fact that Stonewall Jackson condescended to hold me and treat me as a friend. This is McNair's account of what happened, the doctor's account. It's May 2nd, 1863, at night. After shot, Jackson is supported by James Smith and Joseph Morrison as he moves to the rear. Jackson is shot off of his horse and he falls on the ground. Actually, he's hanging off of his horse when they rush up to him, pull him off the horse, and they realize that his left arm is bleeding profusely. So they throw a quick tourniquet on it and they're trying to carry him back from the front. It's at that point when General Pinder comes up to him and it tells him that the position is weakening, at which point Jackson stands upright, looks him in the eye and says, General Pinder, you must hold on to the field. You must hold out to the very last. Do you understand me? At which point Pinder salutes and heads off, and at that point Jackson goes down. Loss of blood, shock setting in. Jackson requests permission to lie down because of his loss of his blood. At this point, they realize he's not going to be able to walk anymore, so what his soldiers do is create a litter. Now, we don't know how they carried it, but likely they took him, built the litter, took it, and threw it on top of their shoulders because they're walking through the woods with four men carrying the litter with their general on it, trying to get him to the rear so they can get him medical help. There's some controversy here. One of the litter holders was shot, but the thing is, apparently he was shot in the leg, but he didn't stumble. He just kept walking. Another litter holder gets his feet caught. I mean, it's night. You're going through brush. 
He gets his foot caught in the underbrush, slips, falls, the litter falls, Jackson flies off the litter and lands on his right side on a tree stump. Okay? They then scoop him back up and put him back in the litter. At this time now the blood is gushing out of his arm again because the wound has been reopened. The litter holder said there was much bruising on his side. Note this well. Okay? At this point he's brought to the back. Dr. McGuire meets him. He says, I hope you're not badly hurt, General. To which Jackson replies, I am badly injured, Doctor. I fear I am dying. He's then brought to a hospital in the rear of the Wilderness Tavern. I think you remember that from the map. But he waits two and a half hours, which I'm trying to, it's kind of like being in an emergency room anywhere today. Huh? <laughs> Here's a guy, why the wait? And I just have absolutely no idea. Finally, McGuire comes up to him and asks him, he's got a rubber overcoat on, so it must have been kind of moist and rainy that night, asks permission to cut his coat off, at which point Jackson says, absolutely, do what you have to do. He takes his, his scissors, cuts the coat away, and strips Jackson's upper body to examine his wounds. The extent, a round ball from a Springfield musket was lodged under the skin of his right hand. It had entered about the palm in the center of his hand, broke two of the metacarsal bones in the middle of his hand. The left arm was amputated two inches below the shoulder. There were two wounds in this arm. The first is about three inches below the shoulder joint. It divided the artery, which means it severed his main artery in his arm, and it totally shattered the bone, as you can imagine a 50 caliber would likely do. Second, several inches in length, the ball having entered the outside of the forearm an inch below the elbow and came out the opposite side by his wrist. So how this one came in through the arm this way and came out that way. So his left arm was actually a total mess at this point. His face was also cut up from going through his horse running through the weeds and the bushes and the, and the branches. So they had to clean the wounds in his face. Nothing serious, just mostly cosmetic and clean him all up. This is supposedly in a museum Jackson's coat. I just don't believe that. When you talk about the extent of the wounds the man had and Dr. McGuire's account talking about how he basically cut the uniform off of him, this looks like a, turn, uh, a coat that somebody just pulled the corner out of it and hung up in a museum somewhere. I don't want to question people, but it just doesn't match the medical record. Okay? General, I'll have to rip your sleeve to get at your wound. He had on an Indian rubber overcoat. That's not an Indian rubber overcoat, and that's not ripping it to get to the wound. So now we're going to take the sequence of events. And I go on to a little sideline. Over the holidays, I was ill, and I had to go see my gastroenterologist, a good friend of mine, Chelsea Hines. I don't know if anybody knows Dr. Hines, a wonderful man. He also is very much a historian and into things. So I might as well take advantage of him while I had him, because I was going through this PowerPoint, and I was confused about some things. So I read the sequence of days and the sequence of events to him. I said, as a doctor, what do you see happening here? And his eyes kind of widened. And I won't betray what he said at that time, but he shook his head. He says, I can't believe it. He says, this is how he died. And he explained to me his diagnosis. Of course, now he'd probably be a little bit trepidation me mentioning that because he doesn't have the person in front of him. But nevertheless, he says, it matches the symptoms. So let's go into it. It's Sunday. Jackson's given whiskey, and he's put to rest. It's 2 AM. Surgeons Black, Hall, and Coleman come present to start to examine him. They informed Jackson at the time of the need to amputate his arm. The arm is removed with little loss of blood. The remote is removed from the left hand. His face is cleaned, and he's patched up from all the scrapes and cuts. 3 a.m., an hour later, Colonel Pendleton arrives and requests orders. Jackson tries, but he's confused. He's too weak. He really can't respond to the general. They recognize that he's not in a command position anymore. He is seriously wounded. 10 a.m., Jackson complains of pain on the right side, okay? McGuire examines but finds no external injuries, listens to his lungs, his lungs seem to be performing properly. So he doesn't understand why his side's hurting him. 8 p.m., pain on the side somewhat subsides. Jackson's doing well, and he's starting to become alert. He's over the shock of the amputation. This, interestingly enough, is the grave side of Jackson's arm, because after it was taken off, his amputated arm was taken by the Lacey family plot at Elwood and his mansion, and they actually buried the arm with a gravestone, and you can visit it. And if you go there, there's basically pieces of lemon laying around, because there's an old story about Jackson that he used to suck on lemons during the battle. People say it's true. Some people say it's not true. Lemons are pretty hard to come by. The reason he would have done that is because Jackson knew that the number one threat to a soldier in the field was scurvy from malnutrition. Lemons, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, are absolutely essential for keeping that at bay. 
So if there were lemons around, Jackson would have done it. So what they find at this grave site are lemon slices, often as people who have passed by. Monday, May 4th, Jackson's free of pain and expressed himself prepared for full recovery. He's anxious, he's ready to get into it again. He sent Morrison to inform the wife of his injury. General Robert Lee orders Jackson removed to Guinea Station. It's at this point that he says, General, you may have lost your left arm, but I have lost my right. Lee recognizes what a tremendous loss it would be to have Jackson out of the game farm. Jackson remains at the hospital tent undergoing treatment while he's waited for a carriage to bring him to the rear. His wounds are cleaned, his dressings are changed, his condition is continually improving. No sign of infection, no sign of gangrene. The wounds are clean. He's being well taken care of. At the meantime, he's now beginning to focus on the battles that are around him, and he's starting to ask questions and what's happening to the Stonewall Brigade, what are they doing? He's now mentally back engaged in what's happening on the ground despite his injuries. It's now Tuesday. Jackson prepared for a 27-mile ambulance ride to Guinea Station where he'll be removed. He doesn't want to go, but, but Lee insists on it. He leaves early in the morning, and when the Teamsters, who are driving all the wagons of supply, find out that Jackson's coming, they stop what they're doing, they clear the road, they remove stones, they remove stumps, they want the ride to be as smooth as possible for him as the wagon is very slowly, about one or two miles an hour, working its way to the rear. In the meantime, people start coming over here, crowds bringing food, flowers, whatever they can, because everybody just loves this man. Okay. At 8 p.m., so you can see, it's almost a 12-hour trip to go 27 miles. He arrives at the Guinea Station. He's, there's no room in the plantation home because there's soldiers in there that are wounded. They have infections. They don't want him to get an infection, so they move him to the plantation office. Okay. At that point, then, he's placed in bed. He rests easily. He sleeps well. He's alert. So if you look at it medically, Jackson is recovering from his wounds. He looks like he's doing fine. His wounds themselves are doing very well. The doctor's addressing them on a regular basis. This is the farm office. It's now a monument. Wednesday, May 6, Jackson is thought to be doing remarkably well. He's now totally engaged with what's going on. He's talking to everybody. He's trying to see what's happening around him. He eats tremendously. Everybody knows someone that's sick. If you start eating, you're feeling a lot better. But anything they put in front of him, the man would eat. He's cheerful. He's laughing. He's talking. The wounds are going to be found well. The healing process is good. There's no indication of an infection. The wound in his hand is painful. They put a splint on it, redress it, clean it. He's doing fine. He's worried about how long he's going to be back there. He wants to get back in command of his troops. This is not the thoughts of a dying man or a man who thinks he's going to die. We're now six. We're three days into this thing. Okay. Speaking with Captain Smith, he said, many would regard them as a great misfortune. I regard them as one of the blessings of my life. He's talking about his wounds and losing his arm. I would think that having witnessed so much carnage in his life and having escaped it personally, the fact that he sacrificed an arm would have put him on equal level with the soldiers around him who had sacrificed so much. He's not disheartened by it. As I said, he sees it in his mind as a blessing. It's Thursday, May 7th. Jackson complains of nausea and wants a wet towel on his stomach. He's now starting to display some abdominal problems. Daylight, he's in extreme pain. McGuire examines him and diagnosed pleural pneumonia, which is a term of the 1800s. It doesn't apply today. He thinks something happened in the fall from the litter. Jackson looks at him and says, I think you're right. That's what Jackson's concerned about. When I fell off that litter and landed on that tree stump, something happened. Okay? They refer to it in his records, the contusion of the lung with extravertization of blood in the chest was probably produced by the fall. This is actually close to what it was. Not exactly, but they're getting close. The problem is meticulous records kept by Dr. McGuire were lost because his ambulance was lost soon after Chancellorville with all of his records in it. So the only thing that could be reconstructed was from memory, not his diary of events as they unfolded. He's also now starting to experience nausea, and they have shown that it started to inflammation. Jackson's given, if you can imagine that, mercury. Nowadays, you can't have it in a thermometer, you know. But who knows? You know, in the future, you may think chemotherapy is uh, is like giving people mercury, antimony, and opium. Okay, so this might explain why he starts feeling a little bit better, you know, because he's under the influence of opium. Evening, he starts feeling better, you know. His wife arrives with their daughter Laura. Okay. 
Towards the end of the evening, he starts feeling better. Well, of course, with his wife and daughter there, especially his daughter, whom he dearly loves. She's newborn. She's only a few weeks old, really, about a month or so old. It's now Friday. They addressed his wounds again. The amount of discharge is diminished. The man is doing a lot better. The process of healing is persisting. His pain in his side has disappeared, but it could be the effects of the opium. He's starting to breathe now with some difficulty. Now, my younger sister had pneumonia one time before she passed, and I've been through a bout of someone with pneumonia, if anybody ever has. You know pneumonia when you see pneumonia. If you look at this whole medical thing, this is not pneumonia, as they say in most of the history books. You don't have the wheezing, you don't have the coughing, you don't have all the things that are associated with pneumonia. But he is experiencing some difficulty in breathing. Why would that be? We're getting there. He complained of feeling exhausted. Now here's a man who was prim, who was up, who was eating. Now he's feeling very, very tired. He's feeling very, very drained. He doesn't exactly know what's wrong. Dr. Brechtenridge believes that a blister apply would help and they'll be fine. Everything will be great. It's now Saturday, May 9th. Dr. Tucker arrives. Everything is done to stay the hand of death. The doctors are now starting to realize that something is dreadfully wrong. Jackson has now turned a corner, and it's one not for the absolute best. He suffered no pain today. Breathing is less difficult. But evidently, he's getting weaker and weaker and weaker by the hour. His child is brought to him, whom he called the little comforter. She lays across his chest, and he strokes her hair as he's talking to his wife. That's what keeps him at rest. He then looks around, he's still cognizant, he says, I see by the number of physicians that you think my condition dangerous, but I thank God if it is will that I am ready to go. He is a deeply religious man, he has no regrets. But he's conscious enough that there's too many doctors here for a well man. You know, something's up. Sunday, about daylight, Mrs. Jackson's informed that Stonewall's recovery would be doubtful. The doctors have now concluded that he's sliding, and he's sliding fast, okay? At this point, he advised his wife to retire to his father, her father's house in the event of his death because he feels it too, that he's dying here now. 11 a.m., Mrs. Jackson knelt by his bed and told him that he would be with the Savior before sunset. At this point, then, she breaks down crying bitterly. Doctor, Anna informs me that you have told her that I am to die today. Is that so? Very good. Very good. It's all right. He accepts it. Jackson's mind then begins to fail. He has confused conversations. He orders A.P. Hill to prepare for action, passes to the infantry to the front rapidly, tells Major Hawks he's hollering out commands in between things. He's starting to slip, okay? Stonewall Jackson dies. 1 p.m., he hears Herman's outside. So he asks the doctors, he says, what's all this praying and all this singing and all that I'm hearing? And this is, it's your troops, sir. Everyone outside surrounding the place, and they're, they're praying for you and they're singing for you. It's all for you, sir. He looks up and he says, it's the Lord's day. My wish is fulfilled. I always wish to die on a Sunday. So he's accepting. 1.30 p.m., just two more hours to live. See this thing. Very good. It's all right. Every time somebody questions him, he's very fine with it. Presently, a smile of sweetness crosses his face, and he cried quietly. And then with the expression of relief, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. And that's the last thing Stonewall Jackson says before he slips into con unconsciousness and dies with the final wish that I be buried in my own plot in Lexington. Okay? Now, this thing seems to be... His wife arrived at the plantation on Thursday with the daughter. She greets the family lovingly. He plays with his daughter, stroking her hair. We talked about that. She would meet with the doctors. She would be nursing him every step along the way. She would be the one that would give the news to him that he wasn't going to make it at all help, help, uh, help had uh, ebbed. She never marries, and she's considered the widow of the Confederacy after that. Everyone just honors her from that point on. She would die in 1915 in Charlotte, North Carolina. She'd be brought to Lexington, Kentucky, Lexington, Virginia, I'm sorry, where she'd be buried with Stonewall Jackson. This is the bed inside the place where he died. You can just imagine her sitting here hour after hour just watching him. The diary of Judith McGuire, May 12th, this is three days afterwards. How can I record the sorrow which has befallen our country? General T.J. Jackson is no more. The good, the great, the glorious Stonewall Jackson is numbered among the dead. Humanly speaking, we cannot do without him. 
The body lies in state today at the Capitol, wrapped in a Confederate flag and literally covered with lilies of the valley and other spring flowers. Tomorrow, the sad cortege will weave its way to Lexington, where he'll be laid to rest according to his dying request in the valleys of Virginia. This is a picture here of his wife sitting at the gravesite, surrounded by, if you notice, there's only one man in the crowd. Maybe all these are ladies, because most of the men are at the front. This is a picture, kind of another courier in eyes, of Robert E. Lee coming to the gravesite. Uh, to visit his fallen friend. This is a monument to Stonewall Jackson. But what killed him? Let's get back to the main topic here. He did not die of his wounds. There's no infection, no bleeding, no gangrene. We know that. But Black called the cause of death pleural pneumonia because of shallow breathing and weakness. But there's another diagnosis that'll fit into that. If not the wounds, the infection, the loss of blood, what killed him? Present medical mind diagnosis. There's some research in medical journals, believe it or not, some doctors and gastroenterologists and such delight have looked at the medical records and tried to find out for themselves. Actually, have died for some intra-abdominal pathology, i.e. gallbladder, duodenum, pancreas, renal dysfunction, liver damage, or possibly a blood clot to the lung. McGuire lost his records in the ambulance. Pleural pneumonia is, is an old term, not another, a modern one. Modern medical schools were polled after reading an article about Jackson's death. Their conclusion was Jackson had some intra-abdominal pathology below his diaphragm, which either precipitated or was concomitant with his pulmonary pathology, which might have been terminal and not primary. Okay? These are from the two doctors at leading gastroenterologists at the University of Chicago. Possible causes. Number one, a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot, which is easy to get when you go that sort of amputation and those kind of traumatic wounds that he had. But think about it. Shortness of breath that may occur suddenly. No indication of that. Sudden sharp chest pain that may become worse. Deep breathing and coughing. No record of that. Okay. Rapid heart rate. No record of that. Rapid breathing. No record of that. Sweating. No record of that. Anxiety. No indication of that. Nowhere in the records do any of these things come up from what we've seen. Coughing up blood, fainting, heart palpitations, signs of shock. None of these things do you find in the medical records pertaining to Jackson. So it's likely that a pulmonary embolism is not what killed him. Other possible explanation? When Jackson was dropped on his right side and struck the tree stump, the impact might have torn his liver. That's what Dr. Hines said. He looked at me in his eyes and he says, he died of a hemorrhaging liver. I said, what? He says, it would take eight days. And the blood loss would account for his lethargy, his weakness, and when you rupture your liver on the right side, the hemorrhaging presses up against the diaphragm, presses up against the lobe of the lung, which interpreted by a man, a doctor at that time, could be some sort of pneumonia because he's hearing difficulty in breathing on that side. Jackson didn't die because he was shot. Jackson died because he was dropped when they were evacuating. Isn't that incredible? First to be shot by your own men, and then to end up being dropped, one of the leading men of the American Civil War. There's your liver. This shows where it is and how massive it is. Anybody knows anything about it? It is a bastion of blood. So if you damage that, you've got major problems. This is a poem that was written at the time. You all can read it. Stranger paused at this mound of clay. See, it is fresh and was made today. Neath of the heroes remains in our rest, who by his country will ever be blessed. Here softly he sleeps while the nation weeps o'er the early grave of our Jackson brave. Strong as his arm for his country's right, bold as his heart in the midst of his fight. Ever the first and the last on the field, he knew how to conquer, but not how to yield till the angel of death obstructed his path and called him away from the field of the fray. Yet though never again he'll lead, armies who counted ample need, still who shall through the south we land, for his glorious name on the pillar of fame that will rise in our lands till the highest shall stand. And when the ages have passed away, lovers of freedom who come this way ever will pause at this humble mound, saying to those who are groping round, there softly he sleeps, whom a nation weeps, stonewall the brave, in his early grave. That was written July 4th, 1863. Oh, went too quick on that. Ah, sorry about that. There's a picture of Stone Mountain where, uh, if I don't know if Nick, if you can get me back that slide, this thing's not really cooperating. But anyway, that was that's uh, Stone Mountain. They have Lee and uh, Jackson on there, but uh, I guess that'll take care of it. So that's kind of it on the death of Stonewall Jackson. So apparently it's not like the history books led you to believe. He had this great general who play, participated in so many battles and did so much. 
dies because of friendly fire on the one hand. There it is. Friendly fire on the one hand. Here's Jackson right back here. You know, and on the other, the mere Neath of the heroes remains in our rest, who by his country will ever be blessed. Here softly he sleeps while the nation weeps o'er the early grave of our Jackson brave. Strong as his all for his country's right, bold as his heart in the midst of his fight. Ever the first and the last on the field, he knew how to conquer, but not how to yield, till the angel of death obstructed his path and called him away from the field of the fray. Yet though never again he'll lead, armies who counted ample need, still who shall through the south we land, for his glorious name on the pillar of fame that will rise in our lands till a highest shall stand. And when the ages have passed away, lovers of freedom who come this way ever will pause at this humble mound, saying to those who are groping round, there softly he sleeps, whom a nation weeps, stonewall the brave in his early grave. That was written July 4th, 1863. Oh, went too quick on that. Ah, sorry about that. There's a picture of Stone Mountain where, uh, if I don't know if Nick, if you can get me back that slide, this thing's not really cooperate. But anyway, that was that's uh, Stone Mountain. They have Ray and uh, Jackson on there, but uh, I guess that'll take care of it. So that's kind of it on the death of Stonewall Jackson. So apparently it's not like the history books led you to believe. He had this great general who play, participated in so many battles and did so much, dies because of friendly fire on the one hand. There it is. Friendly fire on the one hand. Here's Jackson right back here. You know, and on the other, the mere accident of fate of having one of his men twist his ankle in the underbrush, trip, drop the litter, and were well, that not bad enough when he fell, could have landed on his hip, could have landed on his leg, he landed on that part of portion of his back right where his liver was, which likely ruptured his liver, and that's what led to his death. So thank you very much. <laughs>